to this. Just a little bit of housekeeping. So we decided not to make it a webinar. Actually, I'm not even sure we could with our accounts. <laughs> 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 So, so you're, you're all there, but um, what we would like you to do uh, once Jerry starts presenting, if you could all mute yourselves, and maybe even, I don't know if it makes a difference, but maybe even turn off the cameras for that period. And then when Jerry is done with the presentation, you can all come back. And what we were hoping to do is that um, if you want to ask Jerry a question that you just write in the chat, I have a question. You don't have to write the question. Nobody else is gonna read the question for you, but Conrad is actually gonna moderate and sort of make sure that only one person speaks at a time. And let's just see how that goes. And maybe um, once we lose people, it's gonna get more relaxed and we can just talk freely. But I think with 30 people, there's the danger that Three people try to talk at the same time and then you try to figure out who goes first and so we were thinking that uh, Conrad could moderate it um, yeah. if if you guys just write in the chat I have a question and that brings me to the question whether everybody um, knows how to use the chat um, raise your hand if you don't and maybe I'll see you <laughs> so all the people that I see on my screen right now seem fine with it so Let's just, let's just go with that plan. Mm -hmm. And Claudia, yes. do, do circulate my email along with anything else you circulate. And if people have specific questions we don't get to, you think of something else or there's a detail you want, sim simply e email me and you won't get a long answer, I promise, but, but, but I'll try to get you an answer. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Jerry, whom we love very, very much. He is a wonderful human being and an amazing naturalist, and we feel so honored to actually know him a little bit, have had the opportunity to go to the field with him and explore nature together with him. Um, he is currently directing the, the Morgan Forest Atlas Project but he's a former staff scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society Adirondack program. And as part of his work now, he does field work, photography, writing, graphics, and the design for the Atlas project. And he will tell us all about that. But he was actually trained in physics and philosophy and it really shows he's just this well-rounded person um, who's not just, who doesn't just see plants or whatever he, he sees the whole picture and and that that makes it part of the fun of, of being with him and he has 50 years of field experience as a botanist and ecologist in the northern region and he has written several amazing books including the adirondack atlas acid rain in the adirondacks protecting biodiversity and conservation easements and climate change in the adirondacks and so and now he now he's on a mission to provide us with a new generation of field guides. And Jerry, I would like you to just take it away from there. So if you guys could all mute yourselves, maybe stop your videos. And Jerry is going to share his screen. And Great. So we're into share screen. And that is fine. And we are into presentation. So you should have a full screen display now. Is that working, Claudia? Yes, it is. Thank Good. you. <laughs> Here we go. So it's wonderful. To, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I don't know how many years ago it was when Claudia and Conrad stood up at a meeting and I was there and I just wandered in because I didn't know anything about the farmstead ecology uh, program. And I sat and listened and I said to myself, there isn't anything like this anywhere. These, 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 these two are the real thing and they're doing it. And I, I haven't wavered in that opinion in all the years since. So it's, when I get a chance to do something with it, it is a real pleasure. I'll tell the story of the Atlas Project very briefly because it does have a story. 
And then I'll try to put you in the driver's seat, as it were, eight years ago of what we wanted to do and then the problems and the constraints and how we chose to do it. And then for the last half or third of this uh, presentation, last third maybe, uh, I'll show you where we still have to go. We're, we're not done yet, but uh, we've, we've, had a, we've had a pretty good run. So it is 10 years ago. Um, I have been working in conservation biology for a long, long time at that point. Uh, I've had wonderful commissions. I've done something like 20 book length reports on landscapes all over the Northeast uh, with the Wildlife Conservation Society and with the uh, Open Space Institute. I published five books. I've said, you know, I've talked about climate change. I've talked about valuable landscapes and landscape history. I have talked about the history of acid rain research, which is a, a thrilling, the acid rain is not thrilling, but the scientific response to it and the really heroic role that the Adirondacks played in that on a world scale were thrilling things to con chronicle. I have said pretty much all I have to say, you know, Jane Dorney and I between us and, and with one other friend visited 180 swimming holes in two years and said, tried them all out and said all we had to say about swimming holes. Uh, the question was what to do next. And it was very clear to me at that point that you know, I'd had the great pleasure of having a whole career doing things that had seemed pretty important to me and was delighted to do them. But I had done nothing really to do what I had set out to do, which was make, make books that would be tools, useful things, things that you would have, you know, keep familiarly always within reach until they fell apart. Uh, that would help other generations. And so in 2011, I stood up on my hind legs. I was uh, giving a lecture at the Adirondack Museum, uh, a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, afterwards, somebody said, okay, what are you gonna do next? And I said, well, you know, I, I think it's about time uh, for me to write about what I really know about and have, you know, have been thinking about for 40 years, which is field guides, uh, my favorite form of literature. You know, I started out drafting some when in 1972, when I moved here to White Creek, I've never finished one. This, so it's about time. So here's what I want to do. And a pilot and philanthropist, Ed McNeil, now our board chair, uh, with whom I had done photo observation flights, uh, in aircraft that he had built by hand. They, they have only 40,000 rivets in the wings and the body and so on, and another 20,000 in the floats, all drilled three times and then riveted by hand. Uh, he said, you've just outlined a million and a half dollar project. You're going to need a board of directors and you're going to need a foundation. And I sort of swallowed and said, I, I guess so. And he said, you make a business plan, uh, come back and meet me next week and we'll get started. And so the Atlas project comes out of that. And the original intention was to, because in 1911, you know, all the good field guides were illustrated by drawings. There are now many spectacular photographic field guides out there. There were only one or two 10 years ago, which is an amazing thing to think about, good ones. There were a lot of bad ones and I, I don't, dwell on the bad ones, but simply uh, it is not that difficult to take an out of photograph picture of an aster or a shrew that is even more confusing than the animal itself. And you know, if field guides are supposed to explicate, the photographic work was simply not cutting the ice. So my original thought entirely was to do books like these two, which are very much in the works now, a couple of years away from publication, uh, and it was not to do photographic books. 
but now we are photo, uh, four photographic books, and as you'll see, four digital atlases and four sets of charts into the project, we got sidetracked. <clears throat> and the reason it happened, that that happened, was simply that photography was changing very, very rapidly. Um, and the key, you know, the key to making a good field guide, especially for plants, is the small details. So, you know, the plant people like the insect people, but not like the bird people, always have lenses. Um, when you're at your desk, you know, there is always a microscope somewhere near. Uh, it's, it's, it's like the feather, the quill pen and the holder. You, you don't live without it. And one of the niches that I saw that existing plant books hadn't been done, doing very well is they actually didn't show you the small details. Uh, single image photography has a lot of problems with that because there just is no depth of field, uh, you know, in the macro world. And this is, this is physics, but you can beat it the way many things are beaten in the world now by layering many, many images on top of one another. This was starting to be done on the desktop, you know, away from universities and big computers in 2008, 2010. Uh, it didn't look very good. And so I said, great, I don't, don't have to go there. I'll look through the microscope and draw. That's what I'll do. But then in 2011, that same year, I started seeing some stuff from the insect people uh, that really blew my mind. And I said, I have to do that. So in the next couple of years, we set up a studio and it's here behind me. There's um, another fold down one that operates out of the back of the camper truck uh, to do which I have to carry about 150 different pieces with me uh, and hope that they all work. But uh, essentially it's a way of shooting multiple pictures, uh, 10, 20, with a moss capsule, sometimes 150. The counterintuitive thing is that the smaller the object gets, if you want it all in focus, the more pictures you have to shoot. And it, can, it consists of simply a very controlled, sorry, cursor problems here, very controlled way of moving the camera. Uh, a few of the pieces are here in front of me, so uh, macro and ultra macro lenses, you know, the 65 millimeter uh, Canon that is a five to one lens, one to one to five to one lens is my absolute bread and butter. But now that we're working with grasses and some small things, actually a lot of the grass pictures you'll see are shot through a, a big fat telephoto lens within a Japanese metallurgical microscope lens in front of it. And you know, I mean, here's a funny thing. You've got to be able to move small specimens fairly accurately. So this thing that I call a specimen carrier there is actually cobbled together. It's whatever pieces 10 years ago, I simply had in a drawer that could get up about this high and had some screws on them that you could turn. Uh, I said, as soon as I know what I need, I'll build a better one. Well, there's been no need for a better one. So, let me, you know, let me switch topic for a moment and then to return to this. There are lots of field guides out there. Uh, why did we want to make them? Well, we wanted to get the illustrations better. Plants are identified by small details and they're also visualized by small details and we wanted to get them really clear. We want to do some other things too, and I'll mention them as I go along, but I'll just say down the list now. Um, field guides compare things really well, but not all of them do it. So if you think of the original Peterson books, you know, uh, if you have the 1935, 22, I think, woodpeckers all on one page, you know, the, the whole East US worth of woodpeckers, all there side by side, diagrammatically. The eye can move very effectively between them. Uh, 
So we wanted to make sure we had comparison. Diagnosis I'll talk about, but Peterson did that too. He did almost everything well, uh, you know, and diagnosis is to me a verbal thing. It is being able to say what you see that makes this a gooseberry, this a prickly ash, this a New Jersey tea, this a witch hazel. And there's something very important about overlaying words and pictures. Uh, they work together in, in certain ways so that we wanted that. And then, you know, I'll talk a little bit navigation in just a moment. Anyway, the wonderful thing about stack photography was that we, I could finally take pictures that showed pretty much the things that I wanted to see. And I could take them in a studio where I could get rid of the backgrounds, isolate the object from the clutter in which it lives. And even more important, I could start putting things side by side to compare them. So, you know, I could start realizing if you like the Peterson woodpecker plate uh, with, you know, with good pictures. So we were, my original thought was simply, I was taking these, I was going to take thousands of these, but they would be things that I would work from and draw with and then make illustrated books with diagrams for the actual field guides. But as these, after a year or two, as these pictures came in, it became very clear that, you know, we had something that was a unique resource. We now have 20,000 of these. We, we have about 5,000 or 7,000 up on the website, northernforestatlas.org. We also have, and I'll show you some of these later, four or 5,000 for free download in the form of digital atlases, which I'll talk about in a moment. But it was clear that we couldn't just simply sit like Scrooge on his money on these photographs that they by themselves were an asset and we wanted to get the asset out there. So the question then was in what form? And to think about that, we had to think about what makes field guides work, the, you know, the ones we all really use and rely on and what we needed. And certainly one of the things is that photographs are wonderful, but they don't speak in entirely clearly by themselves. I mean, they're just the object. So, you know, if you lay down yellow oak, chestnut oak, burr oak, swamp white oak leaves next to one another, given the variety, you still may not know what you're seeing. It's, it's, it's not automatic like, you know, this is a robin and this is a hermit thrush. You see differences, but you don't know what they mean. So one of the things that was clear was that we needed to start annotating. In other words, we needed to start getting text up close, making some divisions, but more and more just pointing out things. And this in introduces a very interesting sort of double track. It introduces, if you like, two speaking voices into the development of the photographic guide. One voice uh, is the objects themselves. And I've, I've found that if photographed well and carefully and quietly, by quietly I mean without me trying to make too much of a point of things, do tricky lighting, do anything uh, artistic. If I just simply have a studio and let the plants come in and take 20 or 30 stacks of them, they will talk. You know, so I, I think of the photography here as the plants speaking in their own voice. But then there are the people and the people see them in many different ways. I as a teacher, as a naturalist, have one way that I see them or several ways. Other people have different ways. So this prose here, even though it's only a few words, you know, I have really brought 50 years of skill as a writer, for better or for worse, to, trying, to try to find a few words, 50 words on a page, 100 words, that make the differences plain. Um, I have no idea why it went to the end, end of the whole lecture, but I've got to get back. OK.
okay. Try that again. Uh, our first photographic book, Trees and Shrubs, is entirely photography and annotation, and not much annotation. It was, it was sort of our real minimalist statement. As we went along to book two, which is in print, the sedges, and book three, the mosses, these are harder. They're small things, and we needed more. And it was clear that this was a point at which I needed to bring in icons to save words. This means common. This is a must-know species. It means common in the right habitats. In the right habitat, there's no habitat in the Hudson Valley that is the right habitat for this because it's northern. Um, and this means this is one, if you're knocking around in those habitats, you really must know. That's, that's me being moral. And this is one that says, you know, it's tiny, a mi microscope or a strong lens is going to help you. So we needed the icons, but I also had a real place for diagrams. And I like making these diagrams. Again, they're closer to the language. Uh, I am not an artist. I work from photographs. I don't say, how can I make this pretty? How can I wow anybody? I simply say, what is the fewest lines that I can put on a computer screen that still show what I consider to be the most important thing about the plant? So again, it's a real minimalist portraiture or like circus portraits or something like that. Um, and they have a couple of different uses. But here, for instance, in the top row, you have two sedges, this one and this one, closely related. They share a group. They share many features. They differ in these features, but it's nice to know something about that group. And so I wanted a more generalized drawing that wasn't this one and it wasn't this one to point out the features that are in common to the whole group. So this I call a diagnostic group drawing or just a drawing of group characters. In the case of the mosses, contrast is low, the pieces run together, there's all kinds of stuff in the way, everything overlaps. So even when you see them, you don't see them really clearly. So, and I have trouble drawing them clearly, but that's, that's a whole nother issue. But so here, I was trying to isolate moss parts, the arrangement of leaves, the arrangement of leaves, a single leaf, the bumps on the cells and so on, the shape of the capsule, all of which are diagnostic. So another way that we tried to, to make the photographs tell more of a story was mixing them with drawings. Okay, it's, it's a question of which button I press and I've been pressing the, the wrong ones. Um, we were going into a field with some serious major league competition. And we were going to start with trees and shrubs because, you know, it's like if you play the cello, sooner or later you've got to stand up or sit down in front of public all by yourself and play the Bach. I mean, you know, that's the test. And for years, I think the test of plant field guides has been how they compare with some of the real fine field guides to trees and shrubs. We saw some opportunities, but we also saw some kinds of serious difficulties ahead that had to be overcome. The opportunities we saw is that there hadn't been a field guide for the Northeastern trees and shrubs since 1958. Everybody had just done what would sell, which was trees. Uh, and another opportunity we saw was that there had been, there had never been a field guide to trees and shrubs or to trees that had really detailed drawings of what you see with your hand lens. And it's, it's a strange thing, but when I walk up to a great big tree, 
I often have, have my lens out and I need to see really small things. So as much as I revere these guides, I didn't think that any of them really got the details clear enough, uh, especially the details of the winter buds, especially the details of the flowers. So those were, those were some of our goals too. And another one of our goals was to implement navigation by taking the navigation scheme that George Simmons used in the tree and shrub books in the early 60s. What do I mean by navigation? Well, navigation is how from a standing start you get to the pages you might want to be at. With a lot of animal books, they omit it. Uh, th there is no navigation in the Peterson books. You flip through. But animals are sort of self-organizing. The woodpeckers look alike, the herons look alike, etc. So once you know what a warbler, a woodpecker, a woodcock, etc. is, you can often find the things. Now the Peterson Guide has tried to do this with an 800 page book with 1100 or 1200 moths in it. And the moth people tell me, oh that's fine, you know, we love flipping through those pages. Well they have a whole lifetime to spend flipping through moth pages and I'm just a very casual moth observer, and I miss a little navigation at least to get me into the families there. With plants, the problem is much harder. Uh, there is no woodpecker that looks like a heron, but in trees and shrubs and in all these other plant groups, there are quite unrelated plants who have some details very, very much in common. So if you simply have a lobed leaf or if you have a stalked bud, or if you have a grass inflorescence with a single flower and an awn and some long hairs from the base, there's still four or five places that you may want to go to. Uh, and I'll be back to navigation in a moment. Well, we had already filled out a wish list of things that we wanted in the field guide, and it was getting too long fast. And when you start to think about this, you realize you run into constraints very fast. If you do the kind of thing that the Peterson guides had done, um, put lots of pictures on a page, and so you have these great comparison pages, you only have room for captions, you don't have room for real text, so the text goes somewhere else. If you integrate, as for instance, uh, Aaron Eliasson and, and his colleagues' wonderful ant book does, you know, they have five pages per ant, and they're not that many ants, so it works. So when you integrate these things closely with a lot of text per species, your species in a spa spread are way down, uh, and unless you do them separately, you don't have good comparative pictures. Um, many modern guides kind of go in the center, we said, okay, well, we're starting out with the Atlas Tree Guide. We are going to go whole hog. We're not going to have much text at all. We're going to have lots and lots of comparative pictures. So turning this rather abstract diagram into the same diagram, but with some of the famous plant and animal books put up on it, you know, you have, you don't have that many design alternatives. You can do one or you can do the other. And we knew we were going to need a way around this. But anyway, so some have great detail, but very little in the way of comparative pages. The many of the classic ones have text in one part of the book, comparative pages in another part of the book. They work really well, but there is an inconvenience, and a lot of the modern texts integrate uh, text and graphics but they don't do comparison very well at all. They do some. We said, okay, well, we'll start here. But, you know, we, as we develop this series, we may, we may excuse me, speak English, please. We may very well migrate into here. And that was what we did. Now, the other question is how these books do navigation. Um, and they do it through a variety of ways. Uh, some of them use keys. Uh, there are books I don't have, have here that, uh, you know, Larry Newcomb's flower book uses a wonderful key that 
it's the only key I can say that has been written in North America in a hundred years that is loved by thousands and thousands of people. The only, I'm sure it's the only one. But anyway, we wanted to do navigation. Many of these books do very little navigation at all. Their navigation is a flip through system. So, so we went back to what George Simmons did with the tree and shrub books. And what he did basically was to say, I'll devote the first third of the book to comparative pages, a la Peterson. So here's a comparative page of lobed leaves. And then once you know that, if you decide, okay, you know, I have a nine bark flowering that I brought in and forced downstairs, I should have, should have brought it up to the desk. But once you've decided you may have a nine bark, then you go to the master pages and you can see bark, you can kind of see buds, you can see leaves, you can see flower clusters. Uh, this is not bad photography for um, the 1950s. It, it's not 2010 photography. Anyway, but this notion that you navigate through pictorial keys, I call them quick guides or character guides, and then that takes you to species pages, has been a very powerful one. He doesn't use text. He said, I don't have room for it. So he just uses pictures and a very few annotations. But anyway, these have been in print for nearly 50 years and there's a reason and the reason is that they work. Now, we had also m made a promise very explicitly I had to my board. And by the way, uh, this is only possible because we have an overlapping group of core donors who have been with us for many, many of them, most of them have been with us for 10 years now, which is absolutely amazing. And a board, every member of which has been with us for 10 years. And uh, somebody looked at our, when we were starting off, our, the head of another Adirondack NGO looked at our list of board of directors and he said, that's the dream team. And, and it was, so, so we had, we've had an amazing group to make this project possible. Anyway, we had made a promise, which was to say that um, none of the field guide kind of books over here have much ecology at all. And some take great pride in having basically no ecology at all. On the other hand, some of these books, this one, this one, this one, many of the dragonfly books are, I, I think of them as ecological masterpieces. Anyway, we promised that we were gonna put ecology in, but since we're putting ecology in, we have to find a graphic way of doing it. Okay, um, I am done. This was all a, a pretty leisurely introduction. So we're now in 2012, 2013, and now I can show you with more movement from slide to slide, how we chose to actually implement these things. And I'll show you first with these graphic guides and then with things that we call the digital atlases. And then finally, I'll show you two works in, pro two works in progress for the next couple of years. Um, anyway, borrowing from George Simons, Navigation by character guides. You have character guides for all kinds of features. So you have thorns, you have bright, uh, bright red buds that glow at night. You have, you know, whatever, leaves with pointed lobes, leaves with no teeth at all. But here we use our stacked photographs. The S and T's are tree, small tree, shrub, and so on. And they take you to more detailed pages. Uh, by the time we got to mosses, we really realized that we can, you know, we can identify mosses without knowing where they were growing, but it's terribly hard. And if you're going to learn mosses, you really have to think of the moss and its place in the world. Uh, here, this and this as two parts of the same thing. And when you do, everything simply gets easier. So we realized we had to start supplying eco maps. Uh, 
sort of diagrams of places with idealized distributions, not of every species, but of some of the commonest species, the liverwort snuck in, uh, and then illustrate them with photos right next to them. So this was, you know, our sort of first repayment of the promise to put ecology in. I did it again, apologies. I've got to teach my fingers not to do that. Now, coming back, coming back to the woody plant book, so you had gone through a character guide, perhaps a guide to evergreen leaves. You were pretty convinced you had some sort of evergreen uh, without many teeth in the blueberry family. The second half of the woody plant guide, imagine it here, is it just simply goes systematically by family because uh, woody plants in the same family often look alike. Uh, and it shows the species. Very few characters. Again, this is, this is real botanical minimalism. Uh, though many of these pages have notes and there's a lot of small print like software contracts on the back that says, if you see this and this, you're probably in trouble, watch yourself and there's no simple answer and so on. Anyway, so here's, here's our first guide, a lot of pages like that. We also, by the time we got to the moss guide, we realized that uh, even though we were going at some point to write whole books about habitats, we simply have to give you a sense of the kinds of places where mosses live. I mean, I, I had a photo, you know, I had some drawings of uh, small bog-like things and of coastal shores and things like that, but you really needed to be able to see them you didn't need necessarily to pick out the mosses. So the mosses in this habitat are deep within some of these fissures in granitic rocks where fresh water from the uplands uh, gives them a little relief from the salt. Here, amazingly, they form a sort of understory on which the sand behind these dunes in Nova Scotia kind of blows on top of them, but then blows off again in the next storm. So the object wasn't to show the mosses, but to show a context and say, here are some things to think about in the context. We will have a whole, uh, a whole digital atlas of habitats of photos like this coming up. But we also have, and I'll come to them toward the end of this, I'm starting to put together basically walks in the woods, uh, narrative lessons of where you go and what you see. Since we couldn't do this personally in the CV year, these, these things which we're simply calling moss lessons and sedge lessons seem to me a very natural form. Now, the books are wonderful, but I really like having large numbers of things in one eye span. Uh, every, you know, you know, everybody comes up to me, sends me emails, phones me, says, when are you going to do something for to put on a three inch screen on a phone? And the answer to that is really never if I can help it. But uh, you can adapt some of these things because I've always been interested in big forms. I am an old blackboard teacher and an old person who would cover the floor of this house when this house was simply a tumble down, almost an uninhabited with 50 herbarium specimens sit in the middle of them in a little tiny desk with an electric typewriter, walk around, look at each one of them, type what I saw, and so on. So I wanted larger charts that you could unfold. Here's a sedge one. You're not, you're not going to see much about it. But the idea is to put lots and lots of stuff on one chart. And then, of course, and so each one of our guides, by the way, has a set of two charts. Uh, they don't come with it. They're, they're a separate product. And this is not a sales pitch, but uh, one of the things our donors said is, we'll support publication. Uh, get these things out as cheap as possible. So 
you know, I think these are now $12 on Amazon, the set of two, and I think our, our books are like 16 or something. And you must understand that that's not what they cost, but that's what they cost after some donors who really incredibly believe in natural history and tools for the next generation have underwritten them. Anyway, so there are those charts, but then for classroom teaching, I like even bigger charts. So I've made several dozen of these giant charts that can be uh, printed out or used in a classroom. And, and so for instance, when we teach sedges, we have something like this up in the wall or lying on a table. People take their sedge and run around and it, they have the wonderful property that the thing you have in your hand is guaranteed to be somewhere in that chart. And of course, if, if it's not in that chart, I intervene and don't let them get near it, take it out of their hand. But the point is simply knowing that what you have is there is an incredibly powerful pedagogical tool. These things we don't sell, they would be much too expensive to produce and, uh, and uh, whole, you know, ship, warehouse, all of those kind of things. So as with many things on our website, uh, they are free for download. You can simply use them online or you can print them out. You can go to someone like Staples with a large format printer, print them out or a sign shop, but they're free to download for any nonprofit educational personal purpose. And way over half of our products are like that. Now, the Moss charts are special to me because the Moss charts let me go back up a page for just a moment, are the first sets of charts we have done. Uh, and this is just a section of one page and there are four such pages or so on, that is all done in terms of ecological maps. So there are all of these maps of habitat. And we did that because, as I said before, To identify mosses, it's pretty easy to identify mosses if you know two things and you cross them. One is what the moss looks like and number two, what habitat it was in. And uh, this is a very powerful way. So, you know, in the northern forest, your basic set of common plus rare mosses is maybe 300 species. But if you say, how many look vaguely like this, you're all already down to five. And if you say, how many of the ones that look vaguely like this are down in a rich fertile fin, you're down to three. So the combination of morphology looks like this, plus the combination of ecology occurs in this kind of place, turns out to be very, very powerful. Are there weeds that can come up everywhere? Sure, there are weeds that can come up everywhere, but you learn those too. So here are my moss maps. And, you know, so this is sort of a burn, some, a roadside, some cultivated ground. Here are the mosses, all short life cycle mini mosses, little tiny ones that live in them. Now, obviously they don't all live side by side, obviously, this one is never always next to that one and that one. So what this is really telling you is not exactly what you're going to see in the habitat, but what it is telling you is something very different and I think very, very important. Uh, what is unique in that habitat? So if you're in these kind of places where the short life cycle mini mosses live, and you see something with slender, slender leaves and the capsules down among the leaves. Let's look through quick. Nobody else looks like that. Your chance is very strongly it's Pluridium. Uh, you see something <coughs> on bare sand or in cracks in masonry that is columnar, silvery, nodding capsule. Nothing else there looks like that. The chances are very certain that it is Bri Brium argentium. You know, so we don't have the situation in birds where there's really nothing else that looks like a pileated woodpecker, but we have a sub-situation where once you know the habitat, a surprising number of 
mosses and of other plants within that habitat are unique in some ways. And so these maps are a way of getting at that. I did it again. Um, short break. Talk about making habitat habits that you can't break fast. I would say something in my defense, but I have nothing to say in my defense. So uh, we had we were on our third book, The Mosses Book, and we were able last spring to realize something that had been in the progress in process for a long time. Uh, each, one of, each one of these books here, Sedges, may have 800 photographs or so on. Uh, they don't have too many habitat photographs. The photographs are not tiny. We could not make we chose not to make, but we could not make a pocket size photographic book that worked. The photos would be just too small. But these photos have super, super high resolution. And instead of 800 woody plant books, photos, you know, I had close to 10,000 stacked photos. So we wanted to make a different kind of access to them. And the wonderful thing about making so I said I will just make an enormous PDF file uh, indexed digitally with everything zoomable so you can go right in and see all the details and I'll be able to put in as much as I want there's nobody to stop me you know uh, it can be as long as I want and and after being jealous you know of every punctuation mark uh, you know of every article of every unnecessary intensifying adjective, out they come to have more space for pictures. This was really freeing. So we have made, we have made and published three of these. They are on our website, they're big downloads. Uh, they come from a French server so that they take a little bit of time, but they're very downloadable. They're in the one gigabyte range. Uh, they are free, again, all private nonprofit uh, educational uses. And we could do a lot of things. Okay, got to get its attention here. We could do a lot of things that there weren't space for in the other books. So one of the things was just to do comparisons for each genus. So, you know, for instance, here are a batch of our three, three junipers. Another thing, and the thing that I really think is really wonderfully fun about these. Programs fighting me, here we go. Um, is that they are zoomable. So I won't, because of, you know, because of how the screen sharing works, I don't have my zoom command operating right now. But this picture here, which is full size when you open it can actually be zoomed in two or three times to see the details of the individual leaves before it pixelates. These, I have to say, are the largest collection of high resolution botanical images that have made available. Um, they are wonderful. I'm looking at them on a 5K screen on an iMac and they're wonderful that way. But put them on one of the new iPads where you can just scroll through like this and then you can move any picture around and then you can just zoom it up like that and zoom it down. And they become a toy. It's almost like you could walk in a forest of these plants and you could go up to any plant with your magic wand and say, triple in size, please. And it will do that when you ask and they say, okay, I'm Alice, shrink back down again and it will do that. So uh, if you like plants, download these things, put them on an iPad or something like that and uh, I'm just really, really pleased with them. They're, they're, are, they're something that hasn't existed until we were able to make it. We also, I am getting more and more habitat photos. 
uh, the next two years I'll be taking mostly habitat photos because I'm pretty much done with close-up photography now. And we were able to put a lot of them in the digital atlases and we're looking forward to a fifth digital atlas of habitats in about two years. Anyway, so we've got habitat photographs. Here we're up at the end of Mani the northeast end of Mani northwest end of Manitoulin Island on limestone pavement on Lake Huron. Oh, and the other thing I would say is that we try to be very specific about naming these. It, this just isn't a photograph of conifers somewhere on a rock, but we try to be, we try to label as many of the identifiable species as really stand out. And then we try to be really specific about the places. So that seems to me, if you like geography, you wanna know where you're looking. That's where we are now. Um, so we have three sets of three digital atlas photographic guides fo folding charts done. This set is intended to go to a fourth volume and then stop, which will be the grasses. And, you know, uh, every day I work on layout and text for it. The photography is almost done in about a year and four weeks, it will appear. And this will be much like our other books, but I just, this is really important to say, when you photograph a group, when you have, and through my colleagues, Matt Peters, Brett Engstrom, Glenn Motzkin, have been sending me, uh, I didn't get, get to go out very much this year because just the FedEx man arrived every day with another, another box full of grasses to photograph. But the, privilege of taking these things into the studio, uh, making them, lighting them, making them stand out, looking at them in their freshness. Many of the flowering ones I get close to home or I travel for. It's an incredible way of getting to know a group. You should do it too, or you should draw them or simply just put them in a circle of vases on your table and look at them all. Because each group has its own presence, its own gesture, its own way of presenting itself, its own geometric style, its own aesthetic. Machine's fighting me a little bit, but that seems to do it. So, and with the grasses, you know, the thing about how grasses are built is they start with fairly large structures. Uh, the flower clusters, but then there's packaging within packaging. So the units of that are like that, but then you take outside the, out the outer packaging and there's inner packaging. And often you want to see all those layers. So it has been really, you know, excuse me, but I'm an old man. It's been a little voyeuristic unwrapping grasses. And, uh, you know, I, I've tried to be very careful of their privacy and so on. But uh, they are beautiful things, and we've been able to show for the first time, clearly and in color, some of the, some of the details that are really important. And that, that has been a treat, and then some. Uh, with the grasses, because grasses have a lot of named pieces, and the pieces vary. They're, they're really only about a dozen plans of sedges because they're only about a dozen genera, but there's 70 genera of grasses in the northern forest, each with a different plan of assembly. So here it has been very important to be able to move from the scale, whole plant, flower cluster, uh, spikelets, and then sometimes even down to de details within the spikelets and to label the parts. So we've really had to integrate drawings and photographs to, and I think they explicate one, one another. That is, this says, okay, well, this is what you're saying, but then this over here says, but this is what it really looks like. That's, that's how you think of it. And then somehow thinking and looking like two eyes join. We're also integrating a lot of habitat photographs photos into the book. Uh, it's fun to put them at the end, but I, we decided it'd be even more fun to put them on the pages. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to finish with a very brief tour of two works in progress coming back to where we started from a long time ago to make field guides that were illustrated with drawings that you could carry. And remember the goals were to have the best things from several kinds of field guides, uh, to have really clear illustrations, uh, and they need to be drawings and not photographs when you get them to a small enough scale to show the details that hadn't been shown in other books, to put some ecology, maybe a moderate amount of ecology in, and um, to make sure you could navigate them. So here's a quick tour, and actually now I remember spliced in between them is, is also just a sample of one of the ecological lessons, ecological narratives uh, that we made this summer. So the organization of these things is that the first third of the book is navigational kinds of stuff or comparative kinds of stuff. So there's a glossary because you have to build a language and the word language is the easy language, but the visual language of what these words mean and the language of how much one idea, say a leaf or a flower can vary. So the language of variation and the language of form are the big languages that you actually have to develop. The words are, the words are trivial almost. There are eco maps. So we have to put in not every habitat, but the big important ones with the species there. And then we have a lot of guides to different kinds of leaves, but we also have different kinds of buds, flowers, and fruit. And so we have to put in some guides to guides. And then they all guide you someplace, and they can guide you either to a genus page. This is the genus page for all the maples, or a species page. So here's a, here's a quick tour. This is a work in progress. Uh, it's been, daunting is not the right word. Uh, you know, what is the word when you're halfway up the mountain and you can no longer go down because the route is iced, but you still want to get to the top? I think the word is terrifying is my memory of mountaineering. Uh, it's been terrifying, which is for uh, a would-be mountaineer who never really was, it was, it's wonderful fun at my age. Oops. Okay, I'm gonna tough it out. No, no I, this is the last, I, I promise you. Okay, the, uh, at least somebody in the flight crew is kind of back at the controls for a moment. The illustrations for all of these are vector drawings. I am, I repeat, not an artist, but the plants speak very strongly and by working from photographs and doing very simple computer illustration techniques like poster making, uh, I, can, I can make cartoon plants that still, at least to my eyes, probably because I like them so much, have some of the rhythm irregularity. The colors are all just, the colors are all just to emphasize detail. I can't get the colors right. But anyway, the nice thing about vector illustrations is you can use them small, you can use them big, you can move them around, you can annotate them. So these books are built entirely on vector illustrations. The photos go elsewhere. They start, as I said, with visual glossaries, which again, establish the language of form and the language of variation. You know, something can look like that and that and still be a leaf. They have uh, ecological diagrams. And here, unlike the mosses, I have a lot of layers to deal with. I don't label everything. Uh, there will be other books in which I will label more. So this is principally a book on trees and shrubs. So all of them get labeled. And then just, just a few of the other things for fun in there. But then these 
call them habitat types, communities, call them whatever you want, I don't care. They get situated uh, in a place, uh, here's an alder thicket, they get situated within a sequence of landscapes. So one can think in terms of landscape progressions and physiography to a particular habitat, to the layering within the habitat, to not every species, but the most likely species. So those are the eco maps. Uh, to get to the leaves, you need a guide to guides. And this is only a section of it. There are about 20 leaf guides. If you have needles or scale leaves, you go to then a guide like this. And this can either point you right to a genus. Uh, there's only one Archithobium, so the genus and species are the same thing. Or it can point you to a bigger genus like juniper uh, or the pines or something like that. And then you have the choice of going to a genus or to a species. The, uh, I should follow you from this to this, but I don't have species pages for these made up yet. But so I can show you with the maples. And so here's a genus page for the maples. And here we're back at Peterson's comparative idea again, but we're doing leaves or George Simmons' comparative idea again. We're doing leaves, buds, uh, fruits, flowers, very diagrammatic flowers with, just like with our grasses, with explanations of the flower parts in cross section. And we're also doing a little ecology. And this, this needs a moment explanation. Uh, each of these is, if you like, a life zone or broadly speaking, a not a forest type, but call it a range of community types. So this would be the oak zone, the northern mixed forest, montane conifer, alpine zone, uh, boreal wetlands, which is the bogs, the northern fens, the uh, open river corridors. And then here are the maple species. And here is how their rough ecological ranges across this range of generalized life zone types. So this gives you a guess to a species. It also gives you a chance to compare all the maples in one eye span. Um, this, seems, this seems very straightforward. And these, by the way, are not the final page layouts or the final topography. But because I'm running out of ideas, we're getting a lot closer to them. I, it's still going to become more compact, I think. Um, if you ask how many other books show you all of the details of the maples on a six by nine inch page, the answer is none. So even if we don't do it that well, we will at least have done it and somebody else can come and do it better. And then here's the sugar maple page. And what I would point out here is that we don't do description. If we have to do, if I have to tell you that these buds are light and dark brown with white edges and pointed at the tips, my illustration is no good. The, what we do is clear illustrations and diagnosis. So we point out the characters that are most important. Let the illustrations do the talking. And then I have all of this space over here to do the things that I really want to do. Uh, some geography here, and what I simply call presence and context, a little bit about the size of it. A range map, the not every habitat, but the habitats in which it is extremely important. A measure of local abundance, it is a dominant. Some things that look similar. A short verbal diagnosis, this, if you see these things, you're pretty sure it's a sugar maple. And then, you know, finally getting to our promise that I referred to a long time ago of putting in ecology. And then a difficult comparison with a sister species. Okay, I don't want to take too much time. Now I don't have many illustrations. I'm going to go through the next few fast um, because what I'm finishing up with is works in progress, trying to, trying to show 
plants and ecology together. I could do a whole lecture on this. I would talk about the kind of ecology I'm thinking about, which is both the arrangement of things on the landscape, but it is, the, it is also the processes, what happens on a rock like this that yields this kind of pattern of mosses. But most important, the most ecology that I'm most interested in is the semi-permanent to permanent structures that the plants themselves build. So I see plants not as residents in an ecology which is built for them, but I see them at all scales as the principal constructors of their ecology. I see them as needing to take advantage of biological and physical flows of energy and materials all around them. But I also see them as the subway directors who manage flows and storage and accumulation uh, for their own use. So I see them as builders of their habitat. There are now about eight or nine of these eco lessons for mosses and sedges, and there will be more of them again on the website, free of course, go to uh, articles lessons, and you can look through them. They're big, many of them are 100 frames long or so on. Here's just a quick tour without me explaining much of what one on kind of average boulders in average northern woods looks like. So there are of course moss maps of what you might see, but then, you know, who are these? Those are just names. So there's also what I call cheat sheets, the commonest and most dominant species in a particular ecology with a particular diagnosis. So if you don't know these, you don't know nothing. So this is where you start. But then boulders are physical systems and they are coupled into physical systems. So you have to start thinking about what life is like on a boulder, what goes by you. And then you have to start thinking about how with different types of boulders and with different types of coupling to physical systems, this results not only in different species, but it actually results in quite different kinds of patterns. Here's some pillows in one case. Here's a mosaic that is a construction destruction mo mosaic. Here are water tracks. Here's, uh, you know, I don't care if you came first, we're the boss, we're taking over. This is just sort of pure thuggish dominance once you're within the humidity pool, etc. So you have to think about those patterns. Now, the secret of these ecological lessons is that they're all warm ups for this book, which will be probably not our last book, but our capstone book. And this is going to take not every habitat in the forest and not every ecological pattern. Um, if I was 20, I might undertake that, but I wouldn't know how to do it, so I do what I can. Um, but it's going to take you within, graphically within, perhaps 20, perhaps 25 habitats to look around. And then it would be presumptuous to say, I know how they work because I don't, but I certainly know how I speculate that they might work. And so it is an errant, unashamed combination of my eco-structural speculations with no embarrassment, with more direct observations. And I'll show you a few of the graphics and then end. So here, up to Branch Pond, the first thing you need to know as you visit a place is simply what it looks like from the air. What are the overall parts? What is the drainage? This is uh, an ex-beaver flooded meadow. Uh, you need to know something about the elevations and things like that. So you start like that. You certainly need to know um, something about how water and other things move through it. Um, some of this I can observe. Some of this the plants tell me. I think this is ombrotrophic. Am I sure of that? No. So again, we have moved again without embarrassment from physical pictures to my mental pictures. Every ecologist, good or bad, has pictures. Uh, we cherish these. Uh, we get around at night in the winter and talk about them and will again when we can get around at night in the winter. So here are some of my pictures. 
it has, of course, echo maps, but we're now beyond single taxa. So we have sedges, shrubs, herbs, and other things with a landscape cross section. But then we have to talk about what goes on here. In this kind of habitat, most of the events, you know, we don't have rock fall, we don't have, you know, waves crashing around, we don't have enormous wind. So I have to talk about a series of biological processes. And this whole habitat was established maybe 40 or 50 years ago, and it gets local flooding and reestablishment. So I have to talk about advection of propagules. I have to talk about recruitments, the types of recruitments and who banks them. And then I have to talk about how the dominants become dominance by different strategies of taking over. And then finally, I have to talk about how the habitat is on much slower time scales altered by peat accumulation, hummocks, hollows, uh, peat gas equilibrium, and so on. So I have a picture like this. And then finally, last slide with thanks to you all. Um, if uh, then we know these processes, and these processes serve to differentiate the habitat you've been in from other habitats that have fairly similar things. So what are we doing now here? We're doing ordination, but we're doing ordination with my little cartoons rather than with axes and numbers. But we are still doing ordination in a kind of process space. Uh, again, I emphasize it is a process space of my and other people's observation and imagination. It is not a measured process space. That, I, that I'm gonna to leave to you just because there's only so much time. Boy, I've talked too much. I've probably talked for three hours. It has been wonderful talking to you. Um, I am going to unshare my screen and see if anyone's still there. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, that was really amazing. Very inspiring and very humbling too, because um, how can one person do so much work? I could, um, I could simply pan the camera and show you what the rest of my, you know, my house and my life look like, and you would know the answer to that. You do it by neglecting everything else for long periods of time. But that's not true. You also have your woodworking shop, and I mean, you you do a lot of things. <laughs> so, um, you guys can, well, I guess you could unmute yourself and. Um, we can try to, if you have questions, um, write, write in the chat that you want to talk and Conrad will call you up. Or we could, we could just try to, yeah, we're still a lot of people. We're still 29 people. So I think this is the best way to start. So. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of being host just very quickly to thank Jerry for the the generosity with these photos, because like we've done, we've used his photos in bud cards we were using, and it would have taken us years to get those photos just right. And we tried, we didn't get them right. Um, so I just, it, just wanted to add my thanks for doing this. And, you know, I am speaking, speaking for the board and for our donor, small donor community. Uh, we, it's wonderful to hear that. But we thank you in turn for using these things. And the board and donors have been very insistent. Get them out there. Get as much of what you do out there for free. Let other people use it. We're, you know, we're not going to sit on a nest egg. Uh, there's, there's no future in that. And the implication is, of course, that, that you know, what we do is what we do in the world for the plants, for the world, for each other as a community, period. Uh, without the community, meaning zero. Tom, Tom Phillips, did you want to say something? I see you have something in chat. I was just going to ask, how about a liverwort book? Tom, I'm, I'm so delighted. Uh, I retire in a couple of years. I will introduce you to my board of directors with pleasure and say that you have volunteered to do it. And I will teach you the photography. They are, they're ugly little things, but there's no accounting for taste. 
They play second fiddle to mosses all the time. Life is so unfair. Um, they are older. They taste worse. You know, everybody has ups and downs. <laughs> Tom, by the way, we all, Tom is a veterinary surgeon, among other things. We all take leaves off mosses to study them. Tom is the only bryologist I've ever met that sews them back on once he is done with them. Well, this, was a, this was a great presentation. Thank you very much, Jerry. Well, you know, starting with the Thursday Moss Group or whatever day it was, and, you know, we all have long lineages. Um, my great hope is that when people look at these things or read the characters, they don't say, how did he think of that? Or I never thought of that. They say, Yes, this is, this is how we think about it. This is what we all know, but I haven't seen it in a picture before. So that's, that's what I want people to say, because it has come from, you know, uh, you know I, could, I could list for a long time, going back to the time when I was 13 or 14 and first learning these things, people who have been three or four generations now, oh, back to Roy Latham on Long Island, who have taught me some of these things. Yeah. website and I just stuck that in and I was going to put your email in the chat also. Um, Constantine, did you have a question? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Jerry, for this incredible presentation. And I guess my question is um, uh, your, your work uh, specifically refers to the Northern Forest. And I just wanted to understand you know what's the extent of that does it include the hudson valley and the berkshires area it uh you know bioregions don't have sharp borders you know just period so we said basically the the area in which the northern conifers uh, we said forested areas and all the included communities in which the northern conifers and the northern hardwoods mix. And that we would, you know, so that takes us down to the southern Berkshires, but not, and you know, maybe northern Connecticut, but not much farther. And it takes us to the edge of the subarctic uh, in Quebec and Ontario. Uh, it takes us over to Nova Scotia, and it takes us out to Minnesota, and, you know, two thirds of Lake Superior, not the whole of North Lake Superior, but I put the North of Lake Superior in any way because it's cool. And I had two thirds of the lake. And I mean, I couldn't, you know, I, you know, I couldn't leave Thunder Bay out. I mean, how, how could you leave Thunder Bay out, period. Um, the, I do Oak Zone stuff. So I do the Hudson Valley and the Champlain Valley and the Mohawk Valley and the Connecticut Valley as they come up into the forests but I don't follow them down to tidewater or to the coast. So I, the, there's plenty of oak zoned habitat, you know, just like there's plenty of boreal and even alpine habitat within the Northern forest. But I don't, I don't, I don't follow it to the place where it's all Arctic subalpine or so on. That, that's a different world. Thank you. And no sharp boundaries, you know. Uh, there's, there's, there's a secret in-house rule under that, which was the mosses, you know, that if we, you know, if none of us gathering the mosses had ever met the thing in 30 years of mossing, probably a student wasn't going to see it the first time they went out either. So, you know, we could leave it out and not feel too guilty. But on the other hand, if it was a rarity, if it was a cool rarity and we found it, uh, I made space for it. We'll, we'll work our way up to mosses. Right now we're struggling with oaks and maples, so. <laughs> uh, there was a question, and as, as I said, I put the, your website in the chat. That's where people could, could link to buying your books too. They were, they were asking where they could buy them. Did you want them to go through there or go to the Cornell website or where? You know, they will, the, the books are available on Amazon and on uh, from the Cornell website and probably on other book sites too. There's only a dollar or two difference one way or the other. It 
doesn't affect us where you go. For the last year, Cornell has actually been faster at getting stuff sometimes than Amazon, just because Amazon was so overloaded and prioritizing things during the pandemic. The, our website will lead you to them, but uh, we, don't, we don't actually do any sales through the website. I have oh, Connor, let me just circle yeah. back to something I said before. All of our free stuff, that is, you can download any of these photographs, you can download the digital atlases, which are now about 2,500 pages and 5,000 images and so on. You can download the PDF files for all these big charts. You can download or look at on the website all the Moss lessons and the Sedge lessons, which are just starting to come along. And so, so all of the free stuff is accessed through the website. And there is also, my, my board chair is an air videographer whom, as I said, has built two specialized aircraft for these. And he takes, he has been making sort of a series now of 30 or 40 low elevation uh, air videos of at extremely high definition of Adirondack communities. And those are all up on the website too for, for use or again for download for classroom use or whatever. That's great. Lee, you had a question? Hi, um, yes I do. I um, teach high school students and, um, excuse me for lying down here, it's just very comfortable. Um, and I, I'm just, first of all, I'm just so enriched by what I've just heard this evening, um, particularly on how to use a guide. But um, in working with high school students, I'm wondering what advice could you give me to get them to really make keen observations and to begin to appreciate how to use a field guide? And uh, where would you start? Um, because I, I work with both groups of very uh, of beginning botany students, but also some high school students have, I work with in the summer, work in a salt marsh summer after summer. And these students are getting very familiar with the flora and fauna in this particular salt marsh. It's in uh, Piermont, New York. And I'm thinking they're at a level where they can start to even, we even have a, uh, a drone that takes pictures to possibly start to work with aerial photography and um, the topography of the marsh, because I don't think it's ever been done, even though it's near Lamont Dougherty and there's been lots of scientists that do cores in the marsh and so forth. I'm just thinking that I might be able to work with a group of students to start to detail that particular region. But also, where would I start with very early beginning students? Um. I'll give you a, a quick answer and then I'll, I'll give you one idea that may help you. I have only worked with students in schools and high school students a little, little bit. Um, and I am in awe of people like yourself who work with them every day. It's an incredibly, to my impression, it was incredibly difficult, challenging, exciting, fun, but very, very hard. And so, you know, the notion that I, I, would, I would have any secret techniques. No, 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 no. But what, I'll tell you what I do with adults. And, and again, you know, does, does the class structure allow it? Does so on? It, your salt marsh students would do it. But, uh, you know, we do a lot outdoors. And outdoors is wonderful. And the dynamics of the field trip are very wonderful. But I also do indoor field trips mm -hmm. uh, as language building, visual language building exercises. And the way, the way they work this, so let's, you know, let's imagine that, you know, we're going to send our students out in a couple of hours and
this kind of flower, the ones that seem to be spreading, the ones that seem to be maybe just tufted in place. So we take those 20 jars uh, and first I just simply stand there with my hands folded uh, and say, let's uh, please take these 20 jars on this table and sort them onto two other tables using any sorting principle that you all want to come up with. Now, does this work with 30 people? It doesn't. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's bedlam with 12 people sometimes, but my teaching style is bedlam. So, so you know, that, that works pretty well. But in other words, I ask people to sort and then resort. And then, you know, in other words, to physically move the things around because this, you know, this builds memory and association yeah. by different principles of sorting. So, you know, uh, if we had the oaks there, we might put all the lobed leaves here and the unlobed ones here. And I say, okay, well now, once the students have done a couple of iterations about that, I say, you know, what's really important in oaks uh, is whether the buds are rounded or pointed, do a sorting for me on that. And then, you know, we will often I'll have things named ahead of time. The object is not to, you know, have to guess the name and have it come out of the bubble gum machine, but is to handle plants, work with them, keep looking at them and seeing how they fit different visual characters that you create or categories that you create. So the same kind, you know, it's, it's just like you want to play basketball. There are a whole lot of moves that you have to practice. If you want to be able to identify stuff in the field, there are a whole lot of discriminations that you have to practice over and over again till you can make them really fluently and easily. And just simply practicing those discriminations, ones that you generate yourselves, one that I ask for with a set of plants, you know, in jars or pots, uh, turns out to be a very fast teaching technique. Yeah, that's uh, brilliant. I think high school kids would love that because it's like a puzzle and they can work in teams and that would be excellent. Thank you. What the elementary school kids love is for me to put out just the leaf charts on the table and give them leaves. And they just slide them around till sort of like bingo, they can cover the one that looks most like them. They, they do not go for analysis. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. I had a Zoom hiccup, so I lost the chat, except for Janice saying who left, thank you. Uh, David, uh, there was a comment that you wanted to say something about how to buy books. Was a, oh. Sorry. Yeah, it was my comment. Um, okay. Just from the access to the books, I was able to get woody plants of the Northern Forest easily just by going to my local independent bookstore and asking them to order it for me. And it was, if you have a thing about wanting to support such institutions <laughs> as I do, it took no longer than any other book I've ever ordered from them. And um, I recommend that as a way to get them. Anybody have other questions for Jerry? I'm going to throw a couple at him and you can choose which one you want to answer, Jerry. Okay, I'm going to close a window and then, then I'll answer. Uh, one question is, and feel free if anybody does have a question to write it in the chat and I'll definitely call on you. Um, what is what role you see for the auto ID techniques that are now coming out where you take a photo and you send it away and you get a, a name back. And then the other question is, you know, supposing you were a young person following yourself. So you had gone through and done the mosses and done the, the shrubs and done the grasses. What other group of organisms, plants, not plants, whatever, would you like to tackle with your approach? So you can choose either one of those or none of them if you want to talk about something else. Let, let me do the first one briefly because it is interesting. There, there are now a whole lot of ways of identifying things, you know, and you can, you know, you can put them up on the web. Um, you know, people, people can tell you the names. You can, uh, 
you know, you can uh, filter the DNA out of the pond and do PCR and get a uh, reasonable, and in, in some, with some groups, that's the, by far the best inventory. So if, you're, if your job is making lists, all of those things work. If your job is finding things, if you want to find simply all the butterflies in your woods, you have to know what you're seeing. If your job is not only to see them, but to think about why they're there, what they need, what other features in the environment, you really need not only to have the book in your hand, but you need to get past the point where you need the book every day. Uh, you know, for years, uh, I, I used the books and then it became my discipline for some years after that, they would stay in the truck, uh, you know, or I would carry them but not take them out because my job was to have as much as I possibly could in my head. Said another way, there's, there's some wonderful stuff on the internet uh, software into which you can play a song and it will write down an approximation of the melody and the chords for you. And, and that's, you know, that's great. And it's a clue to all kinds of things. But if you're a serious working musician, those are the things you have to hear and see. They, they have to be, they have to be in here and just, you know, saying, you know, you, you can't go to the gig and say, well, my computer knows the chords to this. Uh, you've, you've got to be, in order to think, you've got to be able to have, you know, what uh, William James called the furniture of thought in your head. And this is part of the furniture. Thanks. Well, nobody's showing up on the chat. Any, any last questions or comments that people have? Claudia, do you want to? Yeah, I I wanted to to come back to something that you that you said I think in your last presentation that we that we listened to from you that part of part of your goal with those detailed photographic field guides is also to to make a record of what's here right now and do you would you mind speaking just a little bit more about that aspect as well you know, we have, we have no idea how much things will change. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of conservatism, resilience in nature. Uh, I think a lot about, you know, what, what people in, 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 you know, my, my old world of physics call emergent organization and emergent patterns. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to upset forests. They're, they've, they've got a long, long history. I mean, you can, but they, they have ways of being forests no matter what happens. But nonetheless, things will change. Uh, I'm not doing quantitative documentation, but what I am showing people in these ecological diagrams is the plants that, is the plants that a working naturalist regularly saw in habitats in a certain time, uh, in a, you know, in a certain, over a certain number of decades and so on. Um, will that be important as a scientific record? Will it be a reason to celebrate things that haven't changed that we can still see? Will it be an elegy for things that are no longer there? Um, less so with the plants, but certainly with animals and certainly in some places that, that I knew um, things are not like they were 50 and 60, and I was a boy 70 years ago. Uh, the organisms are different on the coast of Long Island. Many things that I grew up with as abundant in the animal world are no longer there. Uh, things have changed. So again, I don't know what use people will make of this, but simply by doing them, photographing them, tying them to places, it is some kind of a record, uh, a personal record. Uh, you know, uh, will it be of scientific importance? Maybe, but it certainly, I think, will be interesting for people. Let me turn that around. If you gave me, or if I were able to give you 
ecological diagrams like this from Hawthorne Valley that had been done a hundred years ago, they would be worth gold. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the people that have, would have made them would have had no idea what they, they would be used for, but they would be precious to us. I hope that some of these things will endure, persevere, and be similarly useful to somebody. I don't, I have no idea whom. Thanks, yeah. I, I can end it by thanking all of you for your, for your attention in a long session to tell you how much enormous pleasure it is to see faces that I have, I have not seen for too long. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, you know, I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity and even, even more than that, you all taking the time to listen. It was a pleasure, Jerry. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Good night. Good night. We hope there's, there's Gail over there. That's one that's been years. <laughs> we, hope to, we hope to see you all in person sometime soon. I do too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Okay. Over and out here. The chat because you got some very nice comments in the chat. Oh, okay. I'll take. A, I'll open the chat. I'll open the chat now with thanks. Yeah, I won't. I won't close Thank the you. chat. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Thank you so much for hosting too. Okay, it was great. Silly question. How do I get into the chat? <laughs> there should be down when you go down to the bottom of your screen and you have your cursor down there, there's usually yeah, there's a thing that says chat. Right. And just click on that. Oh, okay. It's a double click. I've got it now. Gail, what, what, what did you mean with your question about do you incorporate it family? What, what is that? Oh, um, families of the various plants. Um, uh, um, the, 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 answer is, the answer is different depending on the plant group. Um, the, the woody plant, both the picture guides and the field guide that's coming, um, well, the woody plant picture guide is arranged by families. There, there are reasons to do that and there are reasons not to do that. Uh, and in the, the, what I call the full field guide with the diagrams, the systematic section will be arranged by genus and that makes it self-indexing, so by Latin, so that, you know, for beech, you just, you don't have to know that the beech is in the oak family, you just, just go to beech. Uh, but the woody plant families are best distinguished by flowers and fruit because that's sort of what tells you that a rose is a rose. So that in the section, uh, in the section of quick guides to flowers and fruits, there will be some quick guides to families. And we won't do every family because, you know, we have only say one member of the time Laaceae Durka, and there's really no point in knowing about a tropical family that we only have one member of, but for all the big families where it's going to help you, you know, oak, oak, birch, willow, uh, uh, rose, go across the board like that, there will be guides to recognizing the families, but to make it self-indexing, the arrangement will be by genus. And I went back and forth and back and forth on that, and there's no straight answer. Uh, the sedges are all one family, so it's mute. Um, mm -hmm. The mosses, the families are, you know, uh, you know, as useless as the pom poms on a poodle, and <laughs> and they change every other week. Uh, they, you know, no one can agree what a family is, and no one, you know, when they distinguish them by the latest molecules, the molecule of the week, no one can find any physical, observable characters that correlate with the molecules. So, you know. <clears throat> Uh, we we simply remain totally silent on there. The grasses are all one family, so it doesn't rise. So th that's that's your answer. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
I am done if everyone else is done with thanks. Yeah, Jerry, we'll let Thank you, you very go. Much, Jerry. Maybe more than dinner time for all of us, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, Laura, Thank Laura, you. Gail, I see Conrad and Claudia. We, Thank we you, meet Claudia. before too long. You're I hope. welcome. Bye, Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye, Laura. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Okay.